in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Brothers and sisters, today's readings on the, this third Sunday after Pentecost have something in us that grapple, to help us grapple with that question. The question of why. The question of life's purpose. It's the same question that the preacher, the writer of Ecclesiastes, the son of David, opens his text with. What profit has a man from all his labor in which he toils under the sun? He has seen all the works that are done under the sun, and indeed all is just vanity and grasping for the wind. He acquired houses and staff and possessions and treasures and found that all was vanity and simple grasping for wind, grasping for the air, and there is no benefit to this under the sun. The preacher concludes this book by saying to remember God and to put God first because this world is the vanity of vanities. All that we have is our standing before God. Like the preacher of Ecclesiastes, our gospel reading today is from the Sermon on the Mount where we find our Saviour himself preaching in the open air. And the section that we read today mimics what we heard from the preacher and ends with an answer. The answer to the question. The answer is to seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these things, all these necessities of life, all these things shall be added to you. We're told that money cannot save us or even be a long-term benefit. No man can serve two masters, we are told. And we are given a stark choice between God and money. Mammon being another word for money. And if this was true in first century Jerusalem, if it was a temptation back then to be governed by money, how much more so is it in our time? How much more so is this a question that we need to grapple with? And while a person can choose to first go for money, to have their first priority be their possessions and what they can get, Jesus gives an argument for why this should not be the case. He starts off, he doesn't just say, don't worry about things. Saying that on its own, as any person who has experienced anxiety will know, is like telling a wounded person to just stop bleeding and stop being in pain. It doesn't work. But he's telling us something more specific. He's putting our mundane concerns into perspective. He's telling us that our things just aren't that important, but that we are important to God, that he will take care of us in ways that perhaps we can't even fully understand. But we will have what it is that we need if we just seek him first. Instead of being like the non-believers of the time, those who were outside of the promise, even perfectly ethical non-believers, they would focus their lives on what they have and what they will have. But in contrast, Jesus tells us to seek the kingdom of God and we'll have all the possessions that we would ever need. Today's epistle finds the apostle, that apostle Paul, bolstering the foundation of Christ's explanation when he talks about how important we are to God, what our response to God's love should be. He tells us that Christ died for us precisely for those who weren't with him, precisely for those whose relationship with God was askew, and precisely for those who would have otherwise perished without him. Christ died for us because of his love for us. And this love, as we've discussed, is, very, is translated with difficulty into English. The word we're translating is agape, <laughs> It's to give up one's life for the other, to sacrifice for the other. It's precisely this that Christ did. He gave his life for us so that we might truly live with him. Despite our alienation from him, despite that fractured relationship that we had, all of humanity, despite that, he still 
brought us back and brought us to him. And with a love like this, which endured all that goes along with the crucifixion, the brutality of it, a love that endures this, we know we can have faith and trust in our loving God to provide material things for us. Things of less value he will provide. We can share our burden, our worries with him and thus make those worries lighter. Sounds good. Now, how do we do that? You've heard me a number of times talk about the, some pillars of spiritual life, our spiritual disciplines, prayer and fasting, of reading scripture, giving to charity, of going to confession, that accountability and communion, having God within us. And these are important and vital things for us to have. But it's beyond that at the same time. When you look at the concept of vocation, when, it, when we see it in scripture, the concept of what we are called to do, it's often that we'll look for a calling and make that our occupation. People will talk about a calling for, um, particularly in the medical field, for education. People will talk about a calling for this. When we look to scripture, there's one calling for the people of God. Holiness. We are all called to holiness. We are all called to be sanctified and to be saints. It's not just in the, those spiritual pillars that we talk about that this, that this happens. Meant for perhaps most of us, around about half of our week is devoted to some form of work, some form of occupation. Now, perhaps this is just about the money, but I hope not. And if it's going to be about something more, then it needs to have purpose. What we do at work impacts us as well. What we do at work impacts our spiritual life, our, our spirituality. It impacts the person that we are. How we live out our vocation to holiness will vary depending on the occupation that we have, depending on the places that we find ourselves during the week. But the general trend will be much the same. The general trend will still be to, to manifest life, to, uh, sorry, to manifest Christ to the people around us. To live as if the gospel could be written based on our lives based on our beliefs and how we put our beliefs into action, our acts and our ethics, our integrity. How we put these into action. So this week, let us recommit ourselves to this, to not only those spiritual pillars, but to having our spirituality manifest itself by treating other people as icons of Christ, even if we don't talk about it, to, to treat them like so. No matter how tarnished the icon, after all, we still treat it with respect, and we still do this for the humans that are around us, no matter how tarnished we ourselves may think. Heck, that could just be our eyes. That could just be our perceptions. But no matter how tarnished, that's not our place. Our job is to treat them like Christ would have. Our job is to manifest Christ to them and to bring something of the sacred into our own working lives, into our broader lives, and through that to the broader community. Amen.